Why don't we do that? Well, good morning, y'all. We're uh, a smidge thinner right at the moment because St. Paul, we're having a, an open house today. And after our early service, uh, we thought it would be a cool idea, and Mrs. Wallace offered that we, it occurs that we have, I don't know, we've gotten in the last couple years uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 new members somewhere in there. I, I, I don't keep an exact count in my head, but the thought had come, and some people had suggested in some of the surveys, it would be cool if we were given a tour of the facility and the room, and we said, well, our, our building is ready for an open house today, and so after each of our services today, uh, we have an open house from 12 to 2 today, and she was just grabbing whoever wanted to to do a little principal eyes view of the school, and so right now it turns out they're, they're not really prospective parents, uh, they're not really most of them in their childbearing years, but you never know, God's done weirder things. Um, uh, and so they are doing a tour, and it might not be the fastest tour group, so we'll just welcome them when, when they're able to come in. Let me do one thing looking ahead as we start. Um, about a year and a half ago, we did a study called the Red Letter Challenge, in which we just said, here's 40 days where we are walking through the words in red in scripture, and says, what if we put them into practice? That was the, the gist of this book, and we did that to start, I believe, the 2019 or 20 school year, I don't remember exactly. Um, coming up in the season of Lent, we're going to be doing the Being Challenge. So that is about three weeks from today, right? Oh uh, no, four weeks. We have two weeks here where we're finishing up, and then we have the 25th anniversary, and then we have winter break, where we're not gonna try to launch it on that. But for the season of Lent, um, I got a hundred of these books in my office that we'll be doing in our huddles, and I'll, I'll bring them out in the, the coming weeks so you can have them. The being challenge is ultimately this, all the things in red that Jesus just said about being my child. This is kind of like the, the hearing from him, the gathering, the prayerfulness, the quietness, things that we thought matched pretty well the season of Lent. So that is coming soon to a congregation near you. Um, that's just kind of looking ahead uh, with a, a brief heads up on that. Um, when we do that, that's also going to shape elements of our school chapels. Uh, it's going to shape elements of our Sunday school that we're bringing that uh, into there as well. And so uh, on a handful of ways, bringing that emphasis together. So that leaves us with here two weeks and we're going to finish the book of Revelation, which should be doable because we just have two chapters left. Uh, and we could do it longer, like I said, um, but I think I can do a chapter a week, even though we're 10 minutes in right now. And let's start. So here's our, our brief review. The brief review, view and hear the book of Revelation like a musical. Remember us saying that? It, it's, it's fantastic theater. The costuming, which it is in a musical, is a little bit over the top. And so you get to go this, and you have times where you peek into the things. You go, there's a dragon, and there's a lamb, and it's bloody, and there's beasts, and there's people riding on a horse, and, all, and the special effects are great, and the musical soundtrack is coming up under it and heightens the whole experience. We said the book of Revelation is a view of the end times. Now, sometimes we use the term end times as if we're like looking ahead towards it, like, ooh, I hear things are going to be challenging in the end times. And the answer is true. There's a little bit of a, of a headwind that the people of God face in the end times, but it turns out, when are the end times? They are, right? You're in them. The end times are those things between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension and his return. And it turns out we're in that now. And you go, in the end times, can you read, oh, uh, the book of Acts? Can you see times where the people of God were countercultural? In fact, maybe even faced persecution for their faith? Can you find that in the book of Acts? Yeah. Can you find it in the news headlines today? Yeah. 
You can find all this. Sometimes there are movement forward where it's wonderful. God moves through his people and there is a revival, there is awakenings, there is spreading of the gospel in darn near miraculous ways. Can you find that in the book of Acts? Yes. Can you find that now? God willing, continually, yes. Um, all of this is framed by Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And that says, whatever else you're going to see, because the book of Revelation is kind of daunting, whatever else you see, remember chapter 5, the Lamb is still on the throne, and that's what sustains us when we face and find challenging times. All right. We had briefly gone over this, but I'm going to do a brief recap of the first part of Revelation chapter 21, and I'll start reading uh, verses 1 through 14. There, right, the writer of, of Revelation is John. Now, let's kind of do this. The author of Revelation through John's hand is God, the Holy Spirit, who's inspiring all scripture is God-breathed is useful for preaching, teaching, correcting, rebuking, and righteousness. All right? You guys got that down. Chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I saw a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, uh, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south and three on the west. The wall of that city had 12 foundations and on them the names of the 12 apostles and of the Lamb. This part we had already read briefly, but let me just kind of summarize as we're getting into it. You go, in eternal life, are we floating on clouds? The answer is, no, it's way better than that. Whatever God's design was in Eden is still God's design. We would say, no, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. You've heard this before. Now, what this is, and we had talked about this last time, this is wedding language. Um, you know, we might do a, a brief head nod to wedding language. Now we go, till death do us part, or something. And we all know when you use phrases like that, better or worse, richer or poorer, sickness and in health, we all instantly know, I've heard that before. And we totally go, yeah, it sounds like a wedding. That's what this is. Every time you hear, I will be their God, they will be my people. I will be their God, they will be my son. Instantly, in the hearers, you go, that's wedding language. Because a, a wedding in those days was, I will be husband to you, and you will be a wife to me. I will be wife to you, and you will be a husband to me. So every time you hear that, you go, ah, he's the bridegroom of his church, and he promises to be with them forever, to commit himself in undying fashion. It's why I was meeting with a, um, 
a premarital couple getting married this, this coming year. And I would go, know this, your wedding is already about more than you. And these couples that you can see who have been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years, just their very existence is an echo and a witness to Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom of the church, right? Um, we read this in Ephesians 5, the husband and wife, and then he goes, but I'm talking about Christ in the church here. There's something about self-giving commitment lasting to one another that tells the truth about God. Just by the fact that you stick with him, Vicki, you're, you're doing something that tells the truth about God. Just by the fact that you serve one another, you go, it's telling the truth about God. That's simply what it is, and, and that echo is all throughout Scripture. Revelation shows it super clearly, right? And you have all this wedding language there. Now, any wedding, any marriage is an imperfect echo of this wedding. It's an echo forward, right? Now, in this section, let me just summarize this quickly. It's playing with water themes. There is no longer, says, any sea. Right? The sea in Revelation refers to the chaos of this world. Oh, the seas are in tumults. And the only one who can still the seas is, well, we see this in the Gospels, who's the only one that can say, peace be still? It is. And when he does that, it freaks the disciples out. They're going, whoa. The only person that can still the seas is, and they're going, oh my goodness, God's in the boat. That's what's going on with their freak out in that story. So now, not only are the seas calm, which happened earlier in the book of Revelation, now the seas are gone. There is not even any potential for chaos in this eternal resurrection life. And he goes, yes, I'm going to give you springs of life. Others will be thrown in the fiery lake. Now let's do this. We have this holy city, this new Jerusalem. It's a holy city with three gates on four sides. And you hear all of a sudden... Three times four is the number, right? There's 12 gates. Does that mean there's literally 12 entrances to heaven? No, because we've learned in, Re in Revelation, numbers are what? They're ideas, they're pictures. And we go, wait a second. If I say the number 12, does that open a mental file for you? Have you ever heard number 12 in scripture? You go, why, I think I have. And you go, all right, here's what we have, a holy city, with three gates on four sides. The city thing, I have a permanent residence for, what's three? For God's people from throughout all, what's four referred to? The world, creation. This new Jerusalem is permanent residence for God's people from throughout all creation. Now, let me tell you something more about the gates because this becomes pretty darn fun at this point. All right, picking up. Revelation uh, chapter 21, verse 15. John's still writing. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. What shape is it describing? Not just a square, three-dimensional. It's a, it's a cube. Hold that thought. Verse 17, he measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits, thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall, oh, I lost my spot, was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third ooh, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. All right. Now, what was the shape of this city that we're talking about here? It's a cube, right? What's the only other cube in all of Scripture? 
Thinking, thinking, thinking. Anybody know? The only other cube is described in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 20. That context clue help? It is the Holy of Holies, which is where God designs for us essentially to spend eternity. All that is to say you spend eternity in the intimate dwelling with God. Now, does that mean you're living eternity in a box? No. You, you kind of see how this goes. Now, here's what, it, do any of you have Bibles with like footnotes that say 12,000 stadia? <laughs> you know, you kind of go, with, it would be equal to approximately X, Y, and Z. Footnotes try to be helpful. Here, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Because when you kind of go 12,000, you and I who know how to read Revelation kind of go, that's a combination of what numbers? 12 and? And a thousand. Or, you know, 10 times 10 times 10. All those work together. And we go, oh, 12 is the number of God's church, and a thousand is of all time. All right? It's complete. It's tens. Right? That kind of thing. Um, if you were to do it literally, it's 1,400 miles. Now, here's what's kind of funny about that. You kind of go, a 1,400-mile cube, is that what I'm living in for eternal life? Because I, I've seen the diagrams where people kind of go, here's a 1,400-mile cube that exists centering, centering on the literal Jerusalem. It, what, occupies Europe. <laughs> you know, you know, it goes there, it goes to the Indian Ocean. Not to mention, 1,400 miles high, the International Space Station orbits at 250 miles, by the way. All right? So you just want to go, maybe this isn't talking exactly literal there. And you go, yeah, do you think? All right? Now, um, incidentally, Israel itself isn't a big country. 290 miles north to south, 85 miles wide, approximately. You kind of go, I think he's talking something. He, he's communicating a far cooler idea than he is eternity in a box. Make sense? All right. So, now, here's where we got this. Um, how badly did I, you know, murder those names of the stones? Some of you might know better than I. I figure if you just say it with confidence, you're okay. Now, did you picture it as I was describing it, though? Like, there's a layer of onyx and diamond or chalcedony or whatever. I'm just making up words at this point. What does it look like in your mind's eye? Okay, sparkly. Now, these stones, I, I have occasionally done this where I Google it and said, well, how many different, you know, what are you looking at color-wise? The foundation of this city is, picture it, a rainbow. You go, wait a second. That opens mental files from the Old Testament as well. What does the rainbow signify? God's promise that said, never again will I destroy the earth. My promise, I will provide for my people. In fact, I will provide eternity for you. And we get to go, our foundation is built on that promise that God won't destroy his people, but he will establish eternal life. We go, that's cool. So, I'm on a rainbow foundation of the most precious gems. I'm living in the Holy of Holies, dwelling with God forever, and my entrance to it is what? Do what I, I guess I call this a precious, is a pearl a precious stone? I don't know if it counts as a stone. It's a precious thing. I, I, they're really expensive, right? All right? The entrance, each gate is made of a single what? Say it again. Now you kind of go this. How do we get pearls? Okay. Um, someone said time. <laughs> right? Uh, so a pearl is this. It's an intrusion is made into something is made into something beautiful, right? A grain of sand is made into something beautiful. How do you get the pearl out of the oyster? What happens to the oyster? It's dead. Right? An intrusion is turned into something beautiful and it's extracted by death. Can we open your gospel overtones to this right now? How is it that you're able to have credentials that you're able to enter the city opening the pearly gates, right? That's exactly where this comes from. And you get to enter, you go, yes, sin is an aberration, but for the sake of Jesus, 
death and resurrection do I get to walk on this rainbow and I get to exist in the Holy of Holies with the restored Eden. We sing about this. What hymn has gates of pearl? From earth's wide bounds to ocean's farthest coast through gates of pearl stream in the countless host singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What hymn? For all the saints. You know what we almost always sing for all the saints? All Saints Day and quite often at funerals. Do you get why it works? Because you can imagine there's a casket. I am singing through gates of pearl. That person is in the Holy of Holies with God. Pretty cool. All right, you seeing how this all adds together? Good theology is rich, all right? So we go on here. Let's finish chapter 21. John goes on to write, and he's looking around. You can imagine this. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So on one hand, you go... You are carried into God's presence by Jesus. Um, Jesus is the great high priest. Hebrews talks a ton about that. Incidentally, do you know what the high priest's garments look like? His ephod, what is, what's he wear on the breastplate? Jewels. Anybody want to guess how many? Eh, you, you're making good, educated guesses. You are right. So... On his chest, he's carrying what? It's a rainbow, right? Are you understanding all of this stuff lines together? He is carrying one, one stone for each of the 12 tribes. Who's the only one that gets to go in the Holy of Holies, right? Wearing that, that breastplate, wearing that ephod, he carries Israel into the Holy of Holies, a place nobody gets to go. People die if they try to sneak in there. We can give you all kinds of gory Old Testament stories. You are carried in by the great high priest. And you want to go, oh, it wasn't so much about Aaron or pick a priest from of old. All of that is pointing ahead towards Jesus who carries you into the Holy Holy because he is our great high priest. That's how you get in there. Jesus himself also is the light. He says this. He goes, I am the light of the world. The Gospel of John plays with light a whole lot, right? Um, when, uh, what's his name? Judas agrees to betray Jesus. The Gospel of John just kind of goes, and he headed out. And, and here's the verse, and it was night. You go literally, figuratively, there's darkness in that moment. But where the resurrected Lord is... It is day, and it is day all the time. Does that mean you won't ever sleep in the, you know, in eternal life in this in Eden? No, because what God set up in Eden is the plan for eternal life. Even though He goes, there will be no night there. Yeah, darkness doesn't win. Darkness, uh, light always wins, and the light has a name. Um, it talks about this book. No, nothing impure will enter it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life book is a register of a kingdom's citizens. And Revelation is not introducing this thought. This thought is pretty thick. The book of life exists in, and I just did a smattering there. It's in Exodus, Psalms, Daniels, Philippians. It occurs seven times in the book of Revelation. I'm going to do just the one section, verses one through six, and then we'll break for a second. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, 
bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need a light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the, spir of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Here's the cool thing. Some things bookend and come full circle. All of scripture begins and ends with a, got to guess what goes in that blank? A garden. God's plan is still the plan, right? And it all holds together. In the first garden of Eden, there was a curse for the brokenness of sin. There's a curse of Satan. There's a curse of the ground. There's a curse on the people. Why? Because they've fallen so far short. And he goes, a curse be upon you, right? And all of a sudden, that curse, we get to go, oh, because of the lamb who was slain, the curse has been satisfied by Jesus. That's why sometimes we refer to the cross in our poetry or our hymnody, we refer to it as the cursed tree, right? Because that's looking at Jesus and going, he endured the curse. However, there is still a tree that remains. What tree in the Garden of Eden is just described here again in Revelation chapter 12, the last chapter of the Bible? There it is, that you and I would take from the tree of life. And again, full circle, new heaven and new earth is a restored Eden. Now, one final thing that I want to say before we kind of break to our groups. Note the supremacy of Jesus Christ here. How many thrones are there? There's one throne. Now, when it talks about the throne, the throne says of God and of the Lamb. Be very clear about this when you kind of go, we all worship the same God, referring to other religions. If someone does not acknowledge the, the divinity of Jesus Christ, we're worshiping different gods, right? So here's how you can do it. Um, this plays into someone goes, um, are Jehovah's Witness Christian? And you go, well, is Jesus God? And they go, not really. He is a really important part of creation. We go, we're not worshiping the same gods, right? Um, someone goes, uh, but, um, but Muslims worship, um, they, they have Abraham too. Jews, uh, they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're all worshiping the same God. And so here's what you can do. It it's, it's really is this simple. You can point to Christ crucified, right? So you can imagine there's a picture of Jesus on the cross, and you can go, that's my God. Are we worshiping the same God? And they go, if someone could go, yes, then we go, we're worshiping the same God. Christ crucified, raised, and ascended. If someone looks at Jesus on the cross and goes, no, then the thing is, there, there's a difference, there's a variance in the God that we worship, right? Christ crucified. Uh, and Revelation makes it incredibly clear. It's the throne of God and of the Lamb. There is no division. There is no second tier. There is no anything. Um, that is what I've always found is a helpful dividing line. There's Jesus on the cross. That's my God. And you just get to go, are we worshiping the same God? And yes is a beautiful yes. And if it's no, well, then there's something to talk about and figure out in the midst of that. All right. I think that's a good place to pause for now. We are going to finish the book of Revelation next week. And then, like I said, right after um, uh, winter break, on, actually on, in the season of Lent, we're starting this being challenge. I'll have more information for that as we continue to talk about next week. God's peace, y'all. Have great discussions and studies. Lots to work on there. <laughs>